talk to you from this topic, this thought, and I don't know how long I'm going to take. I promise not to be long winded tonight, but I, 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 I do want to talk just for a few moments at least uh, to the church, to each and every one of us. Uh, from this topic, I want to talk to you about homegrown miracles. Come on. Homegrown miracles. Come on. I like miracles. I like to see the supernatural. Tonight, I want to talk to you about some miracles that are under our noses. If we're not careful, we will, we will uh, compromise those miracles thinking we're, we're reaching greater miracles. But I, I, I'm going to help somebody tonight. I'm going to go to minister. And I want us to, to be mindful of what's going on. Moses is perhaps the most historically significant character in your Bible outside of Jesus himself. Come on. Okay? Understand, Moses is, uh, in many ways, the foundation of the Old Testament. I say that because uh, Moses was the man who received the law right. in or on Mount Sinai from God himself. Mm -hmm. Moses, that great leader of Israel who did great exploits. And the Bible would even say that this man would, would talk to God face to face as a man talks with his friend, Moses, that great character and hero of faith, gave us the foundation of Mosaic Law. It would be upon Mosaic Law received on Mount Sinai that the prophets would build. It would be upon the Mosaic Law that Jewish tradition and religious practice was built. It would be the Mosaic Law that Christ would come to fulfill. It would be the Mosaic Law that would be referenced in the New Testament as the Holy Scriptures. It would be the Mosaic Law that would give foundation to our Christian faith. So as you can tell, Moses is the cornerstone in many ways of our Bible. Yes, Abraham is significant because we find him being the first man that truly received promise from God and that from which all Jews descend. But it was Moses that gave structure to Abraham's faith. I understand that Adam and Eve are important because upon them hinged the entire human race. Yet the reality is their fall would be remedied by Moses' law. Everybody with me so far? Right. Right. I recognize that David would give Israel a prominent place in the grand as a kingdom. He would unify the kingdom. It would be under David that they would achieve prominence in their region as a military uh, force. They would be under David that they would receive accolades from their enemies as a mighty force to be reckoned with. And yet David... David's really just a continuation of what Moses started. I understand today that Solomon, in all of his wisdom, had a lot going for him. And he gave Israel a prominent place that, it, that his father even did not attain. And the fact that Israel became the center of commerce and learning and business because of Solomon's divine wisdom. It would be Solomon, yes, that would give prominent place to international affairs, but... He still would not reach to the same prominence that Moses would reach. And I can go on and on. I don't have time today. You see, Moses gives us so much. He gives us the name of God in Exodus 3 when he finds himself on the backside of a desert tending sheep and God reveals himself. We get a glimpse of the identity of God himself through Moses. It is Moses who gives us the Ten Commandments, those ten laws that outline and give us principle for how to live. It is Moses who gives us the tabernacle plan, who gives us the very foundation on how to approach God. Right. It's Moses that writes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of your Bible are written by this guy. He's a very important guy. But I've come to talk to you about homegrown miracles today much as I like to talk about Moses, Moses would have never accomplished all that he had and all that he did had it not been for two often overlooked characters in your Bible. You may not recognize their names. Some of you may. I don't know. They go by the names Amram and Jacobin. They are 
historically insignificant. Scripturally, they are overlooked, mentioned very casually. And yet these two people are the success, are the reason for Moses' success. Amram and Jochebed are none other than Moses' mother and father. Amram, who is a son of Levi, or a, 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 a man in the tribe of Levi who married a lady named Jochebed, who would have three children, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. These two people would play an active role in creating the atmosphere for their son to survive. In fact, they're so important that when the author of Hebrews, again, I'm still in Hebrews, y'all forgive me, I'm just stuck there right now. The reality is, though, if you study the author of Hebrews, you study the book of Hebrews, and you realize that the author could have listed anybody when he chose the heroes of faith in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. He could have talked about anybody. He talks about Adam and Eve. He talks about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He talks about Noah. He talks about Moses. He talks about all these great men. And he even has an honorable mention. He talks about David and Samuel and Barak and, 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 and Elijah. And all of these guys that have a prominent place in Scripture. But there's one little verse that we need to keep in our minds today. Uh, Hebrews 11 verse 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They're not even named in verse 23 of Hebrews chapter 11. Yet the author gives them mention today and lets us understand that Moses operated and lived by faith and would go on to serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords with excellence. Yet it was not, not because of his talent or his ability or because he was perfect. But the reason why he was able to be used of God was because he had a mother and a father who hid him and kept him and preserved him. Come on. I've come to talk to us today. I've come to... Uh, my heart is heavy tonight. I, I'm stirred this evening to tell you we as parents have a right, a God-given right to, to protect our children and keep them in this day, in this hour. Let me go ahead and do my disclaimer because I'm talking to some elders in the house too. Your children are grown and they've moved on. Some of you have got grandchildren and one of you even got a great-grandkid here tonight. The reality is I'm going to talk to you as well. Because we have got to create an atmosphere for our children to survive. Understand today that this world is crazy. Everybody say amen. amen. Our world is crazy. It's not normal. It's not right. It's not righteous. Okay? Our society is messed up. I'm not trying to be gloom and doom and all those things, but we need to be real tonight and be realistic enough to admit that our world is not right. It's not holy. It's not righteous. And the spirit of Antichrist is very much alive and well in our world today. It's okay. You say amen. Is that amen. All right? We are dealing with things in our world that are real and are evil. Right. And we can't passively parent in the 21st century anymore. Right. Amen. Come on. We can't hide our head in the sand and hope they live for God. Right. We can't just turn a blind eye and hope that they make it. Right. We can't just shrug it off as somebody else's responsibility and hope pastor preaches real good that saves our babies. I'm sorry. That has got to go. We have got to be active as parents, as grandparents, as great-grandparents, uh, as a church family. And we have got to protect our homegrown miracles. Amen. Come on, that's good. I know I'm right tonight. I, I'll tell you right now, it's a real issue when you get a message, which I got a message today from a buddy of mine. We're on a group chat thing. And, and, and he sent a message. He said, guys, I don't know if y'all been studying, been, re been uh, researching any of this, but there are rumors going around right now, don't know how much fact is involved at this point, that there are uh, certain agendas being pushed and that there are certain special interest groups that are trying to get pedophilia passed as an accepted sexual orientation. Right. 
case you didn't reckon, realize it, uh, pedophilia deals directly with your children. With my children. With your grandchildren. They're saying that as long as the child has given their consent, I'm sorry, no eight-year-old has an understanding of what's about to, should not have an understanding of what's about to happen. Amen. Now, we can be all cute and cuddly here in the church tonight and think that that's never going to happen and we don't have to worry about that. We can hide our heads under our sanctified pews today and we can miss the boat. But there is an enemy that's trying to destroy our children. And just as Amram and Jacobet had to face some decisions in ancient Egypt, it is high time for apostolic parents and grandparents to wake up and realize that the enemy is trying to destroy your babies. Come on. Yes, I'm a little fashion today because I've got kiddos sitting on the pew tonight. And it is my responsibility to create an atmosphere for them to live for God. Amen. Come on. Amen. Let's go back to the story of Moses and let's refresh ourselves. Exodus 1 tells us that right before Moses was born, there was a, a king, a pharaoh that rose to power that didn't know anything about Joseph and didn't know anything about Jehovah. And he made up his mind that Israel was a threat. They had grown. They had exp seen exponential growth in their population. And now the Pharaoh is upset because, oh my goodness, they're going to turn on us. And so he commands for the midwives who take care of the Israelite mothers who are giving birth to kill every child that, or every, young, every boy that is born into the Israeli family. The story tells us that the Exodus 1 tells us that the midwives refuse to do that. They hide, they protect the, the, the Israelite women and their babies, and God blesses them. And Pharaoh decides to take matters in his own hand, and he sends a proclamation out through the land that here's what we're going to do. If you find a baby Israelite boy that's born, you have every right to, to practice political euthanasia, and you can kill these babies by throwing them into the Nile River. It was a public declaration. It came from their government that you could kill those who were being born simply because their, their gender did not match your political agenda. Oh, sounds familiar. Oh, I'm getting real tonight. Come on. We live in a world today that, that is doing the same exact thing. They're killing our babies. That's why you, you can't go to church during COVID, but you can go to an abortion clinic. My God, I'm getting real. Mm -hmm. There is a war today on our children. Amen. We've got a problem, ladies and gentlemen, in our society, and I cannot, for the life of me, sit still any longer and think that there's nothing going on. It's a real deal. But the reality is we've got to have the same spirit of Abraham and Jacob. What do they do? The Bible says that for three months after Moses' birth, they hid that baby. Every time he cried. Every time he needed milk. Every time they needed fresh diapers. They would steal away. I can just imagine, just imagine Jacob running up to the 7-Eleven to buy some, new, some diapers for that baby boy. And that Egyptian uh, uh, store owner, hey, Jacob what you buying diapers for? Well, we've got a, a little girl born. Because he knew if he told. Let's get real. I wonder how many times they would rock that baby at night, late in the night. Because you know all babies don't sleep through the night. I if y'all knew that. Some of y'all hadn't been in the trenches in a long time. I just need to remind you. <laughs> You're rocking that baby, hoping he's not waking up anybody in the next room. Because if you make something, somebody in the next room, you got two babies crying, not, not just one. Now. Can you imagine? God will let him wake up our neighbors. Come on. Because the enemy was right outside the door, proverbially right outside the door, waiting, knowing that they could destroy this life. It was. It would. It would have been applauded by their government. It would have been applauded by the political system. It would have been applauded by their society to destroy this baby. But Amram and Jacobin hid their baby boy. Why? Because the Bible says they saw he was 
a, a goodly, the one, one version calls it a goodly child. They looked at this boy and they realized something is special about Moses. That's right. The love of a mom and a dad saw something in that baby that the Pharaoh himself wanted to destroy. But they as parents saw potential. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me today. I know I'm a young dad, but hear me today because I know I'm the Holy Ghost. The reality is, is we've got to look at our kids not as burdens, but as, as blessings. Right. Not as problems, but as potential. Right. Amen. Right. Don't you forget that that little brat that's running around your ankles and trying, and as Dr. Kevin Lehman says, calls them ankle biters, that you want to beat sometimes. And if you don't, you say, I'm being harsh, you all know I'm right. You have those feelings every now and then. You've got to remember, you may be raising the next missionary. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. You may be raising the next leader in the church. You may be raising the next Sunday school teacher. You may be raising the one that's going to gonna, gonna start a business that's going to fund missionaries and works all across the world. You may be, you may be raising the one that's going to lead our organization. You could be, just might be raising the one that's going to find a cure for cancer. You might just be the one that raising the one that's going to step into a governmental office someday and make a way for people to survive persecution because they're in a place of you don't know you see we've got to we've got to take and see the potential in our babies i look at my children and i can't wait to see what god's going to do for them and through them i want my children to do greater things than i've ever done for god i want them to go places i can only see without going why because i see potential in them i'm trying to decide which one will pastor the church after me I hadn't decided yet. Peyton's husband might end up doing it, but I'm leaning toward uh, Baylor right now because I think Gentry's going to be too loud. <laughs> but whatever they, whatever calling is on their life, I want to make sure that I see the potential. Yes. No, God help us that we let the world see the potential before the church does. All right. God forbid that we let the devil put the potential on them. You see, he's already he already has put a price on your children's head and on your grandchildren's head. He already sees what, what they could be. I didn't say he knew the future. I said he knows what they could be. You see, the devil understands potential better than the church does many times. The devil's favorite verse, in my opinion, is found in Proverbs. Train the child the way he should go and when he is only going out to park from him. You know why that's the devil's favorite verse? Because he knows if I can get him at a young age, I got him. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we got to be focused. I know you bring them to church, and sometimes it's a burden, but can you just hold on a little bit longer because you're training? Amen. I know it sometimes seems a little crazy for the money and the, 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 the time and the investment you're making into their life, but can I give you a word of advice? Keep doing what you're doing. Amen. You've got to see their potential. You've got to invest in them. Amram and Jacobet saw his potential when nobody else would. And then the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, 23, that they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They saw his potential and they said, you know what, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what, it, what I have to give up. I don't care what kind of persecution I have to face. I'm going to invest in this boy because I see something in him. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. Come on. I'm talking real life today because we could very easily just ship them off and let somebody else teach them. Or we could just very easily passively let the, the Sunday school teacher teach them Bible stories. Or, or, or we could just very passively talk about prayer and the only time we pray is, is when we pray over supper. Or we can invest. Amen. And we can work with them. And we can love them. And it doesn't matter what, who gets mad. And it doesn't matter who, who disagrees. Right. Well, I can't believe you're doing it that way. It's okay. Not your kid. In case anybody didn't know, we decided to homeschool our children. We started Tuesday. Faith is going through her first two days of kindergarten. Loving every minute on it. She did tell us last night she wasn't too crazy about a teacher. <laughs> Don't know what that's all about. We went over to mom and dad's last night. I, I driving the side to side down the road with them. And kids like to go down there for some reason. They really like when honey papa's house. 
walked through the door, and mom and dad said, where's Laura? And I said, well, she's having a teacher, parent-teacher conference. <laughs> We're surviving. God's good. Why would you make that decision, Pastor? Why did you and your wife make that decision? I'll tell you why. Because there are babies, and I may have to protect them. Well, you can't shelter them forever. You're right. I can't shelter them forever. But I can also create an atmosphere. There's some things I'm not going to have to deal with because they're in my house. Yeah. My wife made a statement the other day, and she don't even realize that I took note of it. But she made a statement the other day that blew my mind. We were talking about all the decisions we've been making and, 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 and what we're doing. And yes, we've had moments of, oh, God, are we even doing the right thing? And, you know, is this a good idea? But she made a statement. She said, you know what? I've got, I've got to really, these are our kids, and I've got to do my best. She's talking about herself. I'm going to do my best because these are my kids. And then she stopped. She said, actually, that's not true, Jordan. These are God's kids. Right. And I've got to some way, somehow, train them up and then turn around and give them right back to God. And I went, bingo. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, Daddy did good. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we've got to be in this present world. We've got to understand, I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful that we claim them as dependents on our tax return. But the reality, they are not mine, Sister Lou. Right. That's right. That's right. They're his. Yeah. And for some reason, God looked down at Jordan and Laura Grindle and said, I'm going to give Peyton, and I'm going to give Baylor, and I'm going to give Gentry to you. And your job is to raise them right. And someway, somehow, you've got to turn around and present them back to me. And I'll take care of them. And I'll, but you've got to keep them right now. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to understand we're raising our miracles. We've got homegrown miracles sitting on our pews. I know they make noise during teaching. <coughs> I understand they get rowdy and sometimes have to be reminded not run in church. I understand that they can sometimes interrupt our visiting after church because they like getting on the drums. And I'm just talking about my three. I ain't even on all yours yet. Come on. I know they're loud when we're running, they're running in the sanctuary playing, when we're or not in the sanctuary, but in the fellowship hall playing because we've had fellowship after church. I know it gets loud and that goes, and we sometimes roll our eyes and think, oh, just be quiet. You've got to remember these are homegrown miracles. And Pharaoh, I promise you one thing, Pharaoh is outside the walls going, where are they at? I'm ready to destroy them. I'm ready to to completely rip apart everything that they know to be true. I'm ready to take their young minds and fill it with false doctrine. In fact, if he would really, false doctrine is good, but what he'd really like to do is fill it with no doctrine. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's God. All the things they teach in school anymore is very antichrist. There's a reason for that, ladies and gentlemen. That's not accident. There's a reason why our college campuses are the most liberal focal points in our world and our society today. That's not accident. That's right. Come on. These are strongholds we have to tear down. And we can't passively think about it. We can't theoretically discuss it. We've got to become active in our parenting. And grandparents, listen to me, I'm talking to you too. We've got to be active in our parenting and reaching our children and discipling our children. If you're not discipling your children, you're missing the greatest commission of all. Amen. And discipling your children doesn't look just like bringing them to church every Sunday. If that's all you're doing, you've missed it. Come on. They probably wouldn't do it today, but the last two couple of days we've been talking about the names of God. My kids are already learning Hebrew. We talked about Elohim on Monday. Which means uh, referring in creation, the word Elohim. First time we see the word is it, it, it is in creation. Today we talked about him being the God of truth, which means, which is the Hebrew of El Emet. Yeah, my, my kids don't even understand the names of God. There's going to be a day, Sister Little God, where I'm going to tie it all together. Little lines, and it's going to click, and they're going to realize, oh, his name is Jesus. All right. I'm trying to teach them. We're trying to raise them. And I, I wish I could take all the credit for it. Laura's the one that's pushing a lot of this. She said, Jordan, we've got to teach them. Jordan, we've got to, we've got to push them. We've, we've, got to, we've got to start training them. And, and they'll sit there at breakfast and they'll start rattling off their verses. And I got tickled today eating breakfast with them. I bet was more interested in breakfast than he was in quoting verses. I'm mostly like that too. And, and, and he'd, he'd be chewing on a strawberry or a piece of pancake and he'd be mumbling and Peyton's up there quoting like crazy and he's mumbling along just to make sure he's getting enough out to pass. Because <laughs> if he gets enough out to pass, Mom will go to the next one and I, won't, I can finish eating. 
what you're oh. doing. We're teaching them the Word of God. And if you ask them, what's Romans 10, 17? Hey, can you quote Romans 10, 17 per day? Can you? Can you? You're not going to? She's not going to do it. I didn't, she can put her on the spot. She can quote these verses, and sometimes she has a little help, sometimes she doesn't, and some of them she gets them all mixed up, and we all giggle and laugh, but you know what? She's learning the word. Because there's a Pharaoh outside that Sam throw them in the Nile. Get them to the gators. Destroy them. And we can talk about Jesus theoretically on Sunday mornings and Sunday school and just chalk it off as a, 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 a check it off as a thing that we do as culture. It's just part of who we are, just part of what we do. Are we going to be as parents and say, God, I refuse to sacrifice them on the altar of this world? Amen. Come on, that's good. He said, I'm going to hide them. I'm going to keep them. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. And then there gets to a point where you can't protect them anymore. They get to a point where they have to make their own decision and you have to, you have to let them go. But I think, I think it's interesting that Jacobed didn't just throw his baby out anywhere. Jacobed took her baby, put him in a basket that she had prepared, that she had made sure it was watertight, it was comfortable, and she hid him among the reeds of the river. In the midst of the biggest threat that she had, she hid her baby. She said, I'm going to do everything I can in my power. I may not be, may not can understand it. People may think I'm crazy, but I'm going to do my very best to make sure that this boy is protected because he's got potential. And what's really cool is when you do that, when you begin to trust God, God always makes a way. Pharaoh's daughter shows up. The same guy that said kill all the baby boys, his daughter walks up, sees a Hebrew baby boy, falls in love with him and says, I'll raise him as my own. The irony of Scripture. Here's what's really cool. Miriam, that older sister of Moses, sitting there on the bank watching all this happen. She runs up and says, you want somebody to take care of the baby for you? I know where you can find a nurse. She just happens to be able to nurse that baby. Just happens. And she goes back and runs and gets Jacob out and says, hey, Pharaoh's daughter found Moses. Can you imagine what Mark's heart being did? <gasps> I'd rather have the alligator. Here comes Jacobed walking up. And go back and study in Exodus chapter 2. The Bible tells us that she takes that baby boy out of the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. And she calls him. And, 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 and she uh, holds that baby boy once again to her chest. And, and Pharaoh says, I tell you what, I got an idea. Why don't you take care and wean him and take good care of him? And I'll pay you. God, you good. Come on. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it is our goal, it is our job, and we are commissioned by God to raise up a generation to know Him. And we've got to do everything we can to nurture and protect our babies. Amen. Sunday school is not something we check off the list. Sunday school teachers hear me today. If you need to be praying, you need to be fasting, you need to be pouring into your Sunday school lesson. Why? Because you're raising my babies. Grandparents, listen to me today. I know, I know, I know that they're not raising them in your house, but I, I promise you, I know two sets of grandparents here today that their grandkids are always over at their houses. It's the porters and the grandmas. My kids would rather live at 585 than 2601. Amen. They would. Grandma and Grandpa, honey and Papa, Nana and Papa, you need to hear me today. You have a ginormous responsibility. Yes. They're watching you as much as they're watching mom and dad. Right. Can I go ahead and say it? If you want to worship or you want to raise a worshiper, you've got to worship. If you want to raise a prayer warrior, you got to pray. Amen. If you want to teach them how to fast, you can't talk about it, you got to fast. If you want to know the Word of God, you got to be in the Word of God. If you want them to be faithful to the house of God, you got to be faithful to the house of God. So what, I, I wish it was some other way. I wish you could teach them by just telling them. But that doesn't work like that. In fact, the other day, my kids know by now, this year they learned, Mommy and Daddy fast. Come on. They asked me a few months ago, said, can we fast? I said, no, you are too small. I don't want y'all fasting right now. About two weeks ago, we came in on a Monday, and Mom and Dad were fasting. 
And it was a little later than what they were used to for them getting supper, because mom and dad were fasting. When you're fasting, you're cooking supper for somebody else is always on the personal list. And, and, and they said, Mommy, Daddy, are we going to eat some? What are we going to eat for supper? And we jokingly said, We're fasting, baby. You're, you were not eating tonight. And both of them, both the older two went, But we're too little. <laughs> but you know what they're doing? They're learning. I'm not getting roses on me. I'm just telling you. The reality is they're not going to learn because Pastor got up and talked about fasting. They're not going to learn because Mommy and Daddy pushed the plate away. They're not going to learn about giving because Pastor taught about tithing. They're going to learn about giving because they see Mom and Dad every month put that envelope. Put that, put that tithe, put that offering in. They're, they're not going to learn it because, because we put jars out and said this dollar is to give to Jesus. No, we're going to learn it because they saw Mommy and Daddy take their money and give it to Jesus. That's the way they're going to learn it. I'm talking to us tonight because we've got homegrown miracles sitting on our pews and they're trying, and they don't soak it all up at first. It takes years sometimes. But every time they get into the presence of God, every time you teach them a little Bible study at the house, every time you read about the love of God, every time you do that, you know what you're doing? You're teaching them how to live and how to walk and how to be what God's called them to be. Today, he's the richest man in the world. Not just in the United States. He's worth $113 billion. But, but, billion dollars. Make sure we got that B pronounced. The reason why he's so wealthy is because he started a little company. I don't know if y'all heard of it. It's a little company called Amazon. His name is Jeff Bezos. And he is, I am directly responsible for his success, at least me and my wife. We use Amazon. Amazon is the world's leading e-commerce site. They sell everything. Not some things. They started selling books. They now sell everything. They are the El Shaddai of e-commerce. They sell everything. The man is worth $113 million. Wow. What a wallet. This guy's voted. No doubt he comes from money. Absolutely not. Because when Jeff Bezos was born in 1964, he was born to a 17-year-old junior in high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, by the name of Jacqueline. Who in 1964, when they found out she was pregnant, told her she couldn't even finish high school. She fought them on that. They did let her graduate, but they wouldn't let her walk across the stage to get her diploma. Wouldn't let her get to class. But only five minutes early, five minutes, uh, five minutes before, and then she had to leave. Even five minutes after, she couldn't talk to the other students. She couldn't do anything. She could go to school, and that was it. They ostracized her. No, 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 no. Dad stepped out of the picture almost immediately. No. no. Jeff Bezos was born. Mom created after graduation a little one bedroom apartment. Didn't even have enough money for a phone. In order to pay the rent on the phone, she had to get a walkie talkie, a walkie talkie back, radio back to mom and her parents so they could at least talk to her. Lived in a little slum apart, barely made ends meet. Finally met a guy who was a Cuban immigrant. They got married, and that's the man that Jeff Bezos calls dad. Reality is, they struggled all through their life. She tried to go to college. That didn't work out. She didn't graduate college until she was, I believe, 50 years old, if I remember my numbers correct. And today, Jeff Bezos, the greatest, the richest man in the world, worth $113 billion, attributes his success not to his talent, not to his bright ideas, but to a mama who said, I'll teach you how to survive through everything. Yeah. And just last year, Jeff Bezos posted on Twitter, social media platform, a video of his mother giving the commencement address, and I forget the college, I didn't, I, I, I wait for my notes right now, so y'all just forgive me. Giving the commencement address at a big name college, and he simply put, I'm proud, so proud of my mom, hashtag true grit. She persevered through everything, and this man, who is the richest man in the world, stands in respect of his mother. Now mom, you can't give him money, and dad, you can't, you, you, you can't make, maybe you can't give education and pedigree, but can you at least pass on the greatest asset you've ever been given, and that is the truth. Yeah. Amen. 
Let's talk about Ben Carson. You do know that Dr. Benjamin Carson is one of the most intelligent men in our world today. Successfully, just a few years ago, successfully this man performed the first neurosurgery on two conjoined twins. That his twins were born, conjoined after they had their brains were conjoined. And he not only completed the surgery, but those twins are alive and well today and functioning and living normal lives because of Dr. Ben Carson, the first time it had ever been done. Raised by a single mother, him and his older brother. Raised in the slums, didn't have anything. Mama pushed those boys to have a work and pushed them to read. And somewhere along the way, Mama got a hold of religion. Yeah. And she found Jesus at a revival of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And religion became her mainstream. And rebellious old Ben Carson, oh yeah, he's quiet on the radio and on TV and in the news. But can I go ahead and tell you that at times as a preteen, Ben Carson was a crazy kid. Go read his book, Gifted Hands, and you'll blow your mind that that quiet, composed man in Washington, D.C. would act like that. But somewhere along the way, the same religion that got a hold of Mama got a hold of Ben Carson. And today, he is a nationally acclaimed physician, internationally acclaimed physician, and he is the director of, of, of HUD today. He is one of our leading governmental officials. He came from nothing. In case you're wondering, his brother Curtis, his brother Curtis is a retired neuro, uh, uh, aeronautical engineer. They came from nothing. Yeah. But mama put something in those schools. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I hope my kids are successful in this world. I hope they do great things. I hope whatever field they enter in, they're the best of the best, and they make all kinds of money. But if they don't get anything else, I want them to get a whole truth. Yes. Right. Yes. Amen. I want them to know who Jesus is. Mamas and daddies, grandparents, listen to me. We've got to teach them who Jesus is. These are our homegrown miracles. I'm done. Let's say. Let's say. Hebrews. He could have written about anything, but he remember, reminded us that Moses was great, yes. By faith, he was great. But it also took faith with mama and daddy who were unnamed in Hebrews 11.23 to say, God, this one's yours. I see his potential. Do you see his potential? God, I see he's good. He, 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 your hand's on him. God, I, I trust you, Lord, so I'm going to give him to you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our job to never, ever forget that we're raising home from the earth. Yeah. Right. How are we going to... We can't ensure that they'll ever live for God. I, I, I want you to know, there are... You can't make your babies look for God. Right. There's going to come a day. Right. They're going to have to make their own decision. Right. But you can't create an atmosphere. Yeah. How are you going to create an atmosphere? First of all, mamas and daddies, you've got to pray. Yeah. I, I know we talked about that. I know we've discussed prayer before. But I'm not talking about yeah. passive prayers over dead. Yeah. I'm talking about you've got to make an altar in your yeah. they got to hear yeah. mama and daddy pray. They gotta see mama and daddy read their Bible. They gotta see mama and daddy worship. They gotta see mama and daddy be faithful to the house of God. Well, that's not important. Oh, yes, it is. I promise you it's important. Because they're watching. We can't just be theoretical about it. We've got to apply it to our daily living. And this has got to be important to us if it's ever going to be important to them. If you're ever going to raise true worshipers, if you're ever going to raise men and women of God, if we're ever going to raise somebody to carry the torch of truth into the generations that, that follow us, the reality is we've got to learn that we've got homegrown miracles sitting in our car seats and our dinner tables. And they're running around screaming and hollering. And they're trying to wear mama's shoes. And they're playing with daddy's ties. And they're drawing pictures to put on the refrigerator. And sometimes they're driving you crazy. But they're all poor miracles nonetheless. And my question to you, Abraham and Jacobet, will you protect the homegrown miracles that God has given you? Or will you compromise their faith, thinking you're doing God a favor by reaching others? 
I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest mission field is not Africa, it's not Asia, it's not even Alto. The greatest mission field that God ever sent me to was 2601 County Road 769. And there's four souls. Some way, somehow, I've got to reach my wife and three babies. And if I lose them, who cares what the world's saved? Because yeah. hell's real. Hell's hot. And I don't want my miracles going there. I wonder right now if you would just lift your hands. If you would just commit with me today that I'll fight for this generation. I'll make it to prayer because I've got to fight for those that are following me. I'll, I'll be faithful to the house of God because I've got to fight for those children that are watching. I'll pray at my home and I'll pray at the church. Why? Because I've got to some way, somehow reach my babies. Mom and dad, they may be grown and gone. They may have already made up their mind to do something else. But you can't give up because they're still watching. I don't care how old they get. I don't care how many kids and grandkids of their own they've got. They're still watching. Those homegrown miracles are watching. And we've got to some way, somehow, reach them because Pharaoh's watching. Pharaoh's outside the door trying to destroy it. We've got to reach our babies.